we're so glad that you're with us today. And uh, we know that fundraising is a big aspect of getting ready for the gathering. We know that the, the gathering uh, does cost money. And uh, for some people, that, that can be a, a, a big a big issue whether they come or not. And so uh, we're excited today that we've got uh, three people that uh, are, are fantastic at it, that have been recommended, um, that think uh, in, in some strange and fantastic ways. And they're gonna bring a little bit of their experience and the things that go on. Uh, they pretty much guaranteed if you followed their advice that you will make anywhere from five to $20,000 per fundraiser, um, somewhere in that range. Uh, maybe I'm speaking out of term, but let me introduce the three of them, um, and you don't have to listen to me. Uh, Daniel Meyer is a, a youth minister at Christ Memorial in St. Louis. He is a Concordia, Nebraska graduate and has served in both Phoenix and Minnesota. Uh, married to Beth and Caleb and Elise are his children, and he has been to the gathering. He's been to every gathering since 98 in Atlanta. Jolene Seabarth is from, hails from the great state of Michigan. Has been a DCE for 19 years, wow. And uh, currently serving the youth ministry at Emmanuel Lutheran Church in St. Charles, Missouri. And uh, she loves people of all ages and you can see the joy in her ministry as she serves. And she has attended every gathering since 92 in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. And uh, last and certainly not least, Jeremy Becker is a DC grad from Concordia, Chicago, currently serving in St. Paul Weston in Florida. And he has been a DC for 20 years and has, I, I know he's been a part of uh, leadership within the gathering, the past five gatherings, and is married to Kristen with two daughters, Michaela and Natalie. Uh, we are so excited that all of you are uh, giving of your time and giving of your expertise. So first of all, welcome. And I thought we'd just kind of start with kind of a fun way of telling us something about yourself that uh, maybe not everybody knows. Ladies first. Oh, okay, sure. Um, so one thing not everyone might know about me is that I was very active in 4-H as a child. So shed rabbits and sheep and did shooting sports like archery and took photography. So. Um, so one of the things that I enjoy doing uh, is watching a few different reality TV shows. Survivor's one, but Amazing Race is the other, and I would love to be a contestant on The Amazing Race. So that's that's a little inside scoop of something that people might not know about me. Um, I don't know if I've got anything that interesting. Um, I would say I'm a pen snob. And so, um, you know, those like cheap little Bic, Bic pens and stuff. I don't really care for those. I'm a gel pen person. I know that can be very divisive, but um, I've got my little Energel pen here. I know some people are fans of these, so I don't know. I tried to pick something interesting there with uh, being a pen snob. So, Daniel, are you the reason, like, when you go to banks and stuff like that, that they have them taped down and they have the, the big spoon on them? Um, uh, actually, the opposite. I bring my own pen with me into the bank because those aren't good enough for me. But, again, I've got my own set of issues. So, <laughs> Well, here among friends. It's a confession. So we know uh, we're going to jump right in, and we know fundraiser is a big thing, and we know that there are all kinds of sizes of churches, right? Uh, everything from... Uh, people that will bring uh, 80 plus kids uh, to those who are bringing two or three. And, uh, and, and so we know that there's a lot of variation, I think, in between those. Uh, and, and also with this particular topic, I know we will probably focus mostly on preparing for the gathering, but we, uh, this is, we have people that, that uh, fundraise for mission trips and retreats and different things along the year. So this certainly is applicable to all of those kind of things. Um, I, let's start with this one, always a place to start with uh, obstacles. And so with, with three of you, what are some of the biggest obstacles you face when it comes to fundraising within uh, your congregation? I, I think for, for us, um, when, we, when we start talking about fundraising dollars, um, uh, people are, are sometimes hoping those dollars can be used for all different events and activities. And so um, I think for us, an obstacle or maybe just a information piece is that we want to, we always try to communicate really well with people up front that um, our fundraising policies. And one of our policies is that 
um, any and all money that gets raised goes towards events or trips that has to do with a service component. So uh, at the National Youth Gathering, our, we're, our kids that are going on the trip are definitely involved in the service, whether it's through the gathering itself or from another uh, extra piece that we'll add on to the trip, um, or if we're doing servant events in a non-youth gathering year, uh, those types of things. And so uh, we're not going to use that money to go to the amusement park down the street. And so that kind of helps people if we communicate that. But then there's also the other side, if that doesn't get communicated to people, uh, sometimes I get frustrated that, well, I, I want, I, you know, this money could go to help me with this. And now I have to pay the whole fee, even though we helped with fundraisers. So it's just a struggle of communication, making sure that people know where those dollars are allocated towards service. I think um, one of our obstacles is that uh, the obstacle of time. So trying to find the dates to do the fundraisers, especially with a, a school on campus here as well. We have calendar meetings uh, in February to plan out the next 18 months of time. So trying to make sure we can squeak those in and then families are, are busy with sports and other activities. So, so trying to find those, those options that can work for people. Um, for us, I would say, you know, along with those as well is, is the tension that we manage of fairness and um, how we fundraise and um, we, we take more of a grace approach of, of fundraising together. And so sometimes uh, we have those who show up to everything and fundraise and work really hard. And we have some that don't do as much work. And so I have parents and other leaders and other people talking to me at times, pulling me aside saying, you know, hey, Daniel, it's not fair. This kid did this and got to go. And this other person didn't do this. And I try to encourage people that, you know, well, it's never going to be perfectly fair. Um, and, and it ends up being, I think, more of a micromanaging um, hassle to then try to assess fairness and how much time did they give, what items did they contribute, those types of things that their parents help out. And that's something I just try to say, let's, let's try to be grace filled here and know that we're all in this together to, to you know, be on youth gathering. So let's go off that a little bit, Daniel. So when you've got, and obviously there, you have probably three big entities, right? You've got uh, youth, you've got parents, and then you've got church organizational um, <coughs> elders and, and councils and things like that. Um, when, when you deal with issues of fairness and fundraising in particular, um, how, how, how do you handle that with, with conflict, uh, with different parents that, that think differently that it should be this way, that it should be that way. Yeah, so I would say it starts um, at our congregation with our council and our elders. Um, we have multiple entities, like pretty much any church, trying to fundraise. And I, you know, I don't know if it's an official like written in stone policy, but it's the thought that we don't want our Sunday morning to be a marketplace, you know, almost like Jesus overturning the tables where every time you turn around, whether it's the youth or our other entities asking for money, and so we try to be as streamlined as possible with our fundraising efforts. And so we, for youth gathering in our mission trips, other things we do, we only do, you know, three, four different fundraisers. Um, and, and really one of them is a, one main one. So we don't have these multiple things. Um, part of it uh, from there then is understanding that you try to have conversations. I like, you know, Jeremy said the word communicate. Uh, communicating with people, hearing people, listening to their concerns. Um, but then also knowing that there's never going to be this moment where I walk through this threshold as a leader or the other people that help us uh, and go on these trips where there's not going to be a family complaining. And there's just always going to be that where there's someone that's not going to be pleased with how we do it. But we have the support, I think, top down. And, and, and I think, you know, at, at most of the time too, bottom up from previous adults and leaders saying, yeah, this, this worked. This is the way we did it. My kid had a successful trip. There, there, was some, there were some issues, of course, but this is, this is valuable and a good use of our time and really the best way to fundraise here. And, and that's how we handle it. Excellent. Um, so one of the things, and uh, we're, we're so excited that uh, we got a, a great room of people that are here. So I'm, I'm gonna invite you, those that are part of this webinar, to do two things. Go ahead, tell us uh, uh, who you are and uh, where you're coming from. So just your name and uh, the, proximate region of the uh, U.S. you're from. And then the other thing, would, as we go along, if there's a question that, that uh, you would like more follow-up on or something, a uh, fundraising question that's kind of burning in your mind, we'd love for you to, to throw that in the chat room. You know, I want to make sure we bring it to our panelists to, to make sure that uh, 
that they can uh, spend some time on the things that uh, maybe the, the thing, the struggle that you have the most, or the, if you're looking for just different ideas uh, that we can, we can bring that into. Um, let, let's uh, shift a little bit and we talk about, uh, so the gathering of course is a, uh, uh, there's three years in between a gathering uh, or for like mission trips, a lot of times there's a year between those. How do you guys start setting up a calendar, like a fundraising calendar? Uh, I, I know one of you talked about, uh, I think Daniel, you said that you, your uh, church doesn't want to over fundraise and have all that, that in. How do you, with the balance of that, how do you start to set that up in your ministry? What we do um, at the time of registration, the, one of the key documents that we have that actually applies to fundraising and the other things we do is what we call a core covenant. And it at least states, here's, here's you know, the schedule might change a little bit, but here's the main times um, your family groups are going to meet. Here's the meetings scheduled out for the year. Um, here is what our fundraiser is going to be. And we ask them to sign that almost, you know, as, as a covenant, as a commitment that you know, just like if you're signing up to be in band or with your sports team or whatever, that um, we understand you might have to miss something and other things might take a priority from time to time. So we can have some grace there, but we expect you to be here and be an active participant and not just, sh you know, in our case, we usually take a bus or fly, not just show up at the airport and show up for the bus ride to go to youth gathering. That this is a journey um, that, that happens, you know, from a year plus out and then even after the gathering. Mm -hmm. So as, as far as um, the meetings and fundraising, we have that packet all set up over the summer. So we'll have that ready to go in July. So when we do our registrations, everyone can see off the bat, here's what's expected, here are the dates, here's the fundraisers that we're doing. And from time to time, parents will bring up different ideas of fundraisers, and that's something we will take into consideration as long as it's not an overwhelming amount of little itty bitty fundraisers. Like, like Daniel said, you want to maximize the fundraisers that you have and not tax the congregation. Well, um, being Lutheran, we just do it the same way we did it the year before. <laughs> and um, that's the way we've been doing it for about 20, 30, 50 years. No, um, yeah, we kind of the same way. We, we try to uh, evaluate uh, with the leaders that are going, you know, here's what we have done in the past. Did they, were they fruitful enough? Did we have enough people show up? Did they provide the money for the time and the effort and uh, set that out? So at the beginning of registration for the youth gathering or whatever trip, uh, they know what we have uh, laid out in front of us for fundraisers. We've kept that to three um, throughout the year, just because we don't want to, you start, uh, you start to tap people too many times and I think they get frustrated. And uh, so that's, that's, we've done three and we've also tried to keep that to three events that are uh, either community driven or fellowship driven. So it's not just a, a sales tactic of items and stuff, but we're creating an event where something is going to take place other than just trying to collect money for the youth. And so because we have those three things um, that we try to do, uh, they become actually kind of popular with the congregation. And so they look forward to, being a part of those events, whether or not they're a fundraiser or not. So that's kind of how we do it. But we like, like Daniel and Julian said, try to have that all set and ready to go at the beginning of the year. So at registration, everybody knows what's what to expect. Excellent. Um, so I'm gonna give you a little bit of a scenario because uh, we're kind of coming into the time of summer where registration materials will come out and you'll have the information and uh, a lot of people start with that information meeting or think about that all those parents and kids come into that room and they they, they kind of want to know the program, what it, what it is, but I, I know as, as a parent, and I'm guessing there are, are uh, many out there that have ex experienced the same thing, they want to know, well, what's this going to cost me? And, um, and, and really looking at the final thing, right? How much am I going to have to write the check for? So when you have that information meeting and, and a parent is asking that question, and certainly fundraising is a part of that, in your approach to fundraising, is there, do you... You approach it like we're gonna. We want to raise so much per kid, uh, or is it a little bit more open? Any promises you make or things you're careful about in that question? Our goal when we start off is um, that families pay the registration fee, and then the hope is that everything else is able to be fundraised maybe minus the food costs. Uh, we supplement the adult leaders costs as well from the church budget. So that's not something that's necessarily fundraised for. But we also do communicate that it all depends on the success of the fundraisers. 
So the amount of effort that families put into recruiting people to come to a trivia night or recruiting people to come to a dinner or those kind of things that that really weighs in as well. So putting some of that responsibility on them to to help the fundraisers be successful is, is part of what we communicate to. I know that uh, our congregation outside of youth events specific, but um, we kind of adopt some of this um, is that we kind of look at it a third, a third and a third. Um, and we do this for our adults, for our youth trips, um, where the congregation is going to cover a third of the cost. The, the, youth, the person going will pay for a third of the cost and then the fundraising will cover a third of the cost. So that's another way that I've seen it worked out. Uh, we don't always do that with the youth stuff just because we have a lot more youth events for the church to cover some of those things. So we hope that um, our youth events will actually cover both the, the fundraising third and then also can look at it as the third coming from the congregation too. So that's still a you know, family going uh, might look at a third of the cost as what they might be expected to pay. Um, that, that can change depending on how you keep track of things and how the money goes uh, towards, towards different events and things. But that's, that's one of the ways that we've looked at it. Um, we, we do things similar, but a little differently. We've uh, we're really blessed and fortunate to really, really fundraise most of the cost. So what we've been doing is $100 non-refundable deposit to go. And then from there, our, our main fundraiser that we raise over 90% of our money is through an auction fundraiser and uh, takes a lot of work, but it's a one night kind of thing. And so I think typically we've had a final payment probably in the, in the ballpark of, I'm going to say 150, 200 bucks. And so it's probably been $250 out of pocket for a family to attend. And that's included fundraising the leaders. We don't have a budget that, that has that kind of bankroll. Uh, but we, we've tried to say, you know, Hey, this is, this is a way that we can really raise the funds when in our case, we usually ballpark a $1,300 trip. Um, we figure it's better to shoot high than to shoot low and then be scrambling. But that includes our meals. That includes the leader's cost. Um, we have it where it's kind of all in and it's not this nickel and dime or oh, wait, oh, now you owe for this. Or we have the after event and that's an additional fee. It's, it's all together. Excellent. Did do you um are are you cautious in making uh, promises? Because I I mean I, I think about that. That's that's pretty amazing when you come and you 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 say to a, an individual that that the end of cost could be anywhere from one hundred fifty to to four hundred dollars. That that's not a whole lot for an experience like that. Uh, is do you have a, a caution in in making that that kind of a promise? For sure, for sure, with that core covenant. Um, we do have the history at my congregation of, in our case, doing that auction several times. So I can say it has worked in the past, but at the end of the day, like I'm not the one who really runs the auction. It's, it's, our, it's our parents, it's our youth, and our, our congregation works together to make that happen. And so it, it relies heavily on them. And, and so, so I would say that's kind of the gospel side. We work in this together. There's that graciousness, but the other side is kind of the law. You know, if you don't all work together and this doesn't go well, um, you know, we could, we could be, you know, thousands of dollars short. And so that could end up being 500 a kid very easily. So we, we do need to work together and um, commit to these dates to make this happen. Yeah, I would agree. I, I'm, I'm really careful on our side too. I, I don't want to um, scare people away with a, a four figure number, you know, 13, Daniel mentioned 13. I think our last trip was around 13 or 14. Um, to the gathering, you know, I don't want to scare people away when they see that number and like, I'm out. Um, but at the same time, I, I don't want to over promise something where it's like, oh, it's 350, no problem. And then all of a sudden they're 600, 700 because something came up short. So I'm really careful not to put specifics on that. Uh, we always start with here's the cost and here's our hopes. And um, knowing that, and again, like Daniel said, here's our track record. Here's what we've done in the past. And, you know, if everything comes through like we've done it in the past, then we can expect these results. And that's our hope. I think having that, sorry, that budget too, like here's the transportation cost, here's the hotel cost. So like people can tangibly specifically see. Mm -hmm. And I think um, for some of ours, when we set it up to not knowing 100% what the hotel cost will be, not knowing 100% what the transportation cost will be, people understanding there might be a little swing, but if it's a huge swing, we will make that up a different way, not put that on the backs of the families. That's, that's great. 
Um, so I'm, I would switch uh, conversations just a little bit and, and think about, right, we have, once again, we have um, a lot of different sizes of congregations. So you think about uh, probably the majority of the congregations that come to the gathering are 15 youth on down and then uh, all the way up to 60, 70, 80 youth that, that come. Oh, how has the mindset shifted depending on the size of the congregation? Um, whether you're, you're fundraising for uh, 70 kids or fundraising for five to 10. Mm -hmm. So the congregation I was at for 15 years, our largest group was 15 kids. And then the congregation I'm at now, we took 65 last time. And in all honesty, a lot of the mindset stays the same because you're still fundraising for, for the group of kids. And you have, you have a little bit wider pool of people to, to pull in to be a part of the fundraising, but most of the basics remain the same, at least they do for me. That's what I think too. I think it's, it's kind of scalable. Um, you know, it's, it's one thing to look at, all right, we, with, you know, a hundred people going to the gathering, uh, we can raise this much money, but that also gets then, you know, there's a hundred people that are going mm -hmm. um, versus, you know, what, I, you know, you can't compare yourself to a larger church. You got to work as your own scale fits. So if you've got 10 kids working towards going, then your events just might be a little smaller and they might not raise as much, but they'll, they'll still split across those kids like they would if you had more people going. So um, like Jolene, I, I kind of have the opposite. We had 113 that went to 04 in, in Orlando. Uh, last gathering that I took, we, from this church, we had somewhere in the 30s. And so it was, it's a matter of, you know, we did similar fundraisers, but they just, they definitely didn't make the same amount. And that's okay because it, it was just scaled differently. So um, smaller events, um, less money, but it's split among less people. So it worked out just fine. Mm -hmm. I'm similar to I've taken large groups and small groups and um, in all honesty, personally, I'd rather take a smaller group, but, uh, but um, uh, you know, we had an issue last time where we didn't fit into a bus with 55 people. So then we had to get a second bus and work with another church and it worked out, but it was an additional challenge that, that I was like, well, if I had the choice and we could have just fit in one bus, that would have been great. Um, but I, I agree. The principles stay the same. I, I think what is really helpful and as I think of, you know, as the others I've talked in ministry over the years when it comes to fundraising is I think really streamlining what, what that leadership, whether that's you in the pastor, whether that's you in the council, whether that's you and the other uh, adult leader that's going to manage this is being as, um, I, I think, as prepared and clarified, how are we going to accomplish this goal? Then getting the support. So when you outlay that, I prefer that model opposed to, hey, it's our meeting in August to sign up for the trip. We need to raise this amount of money. We have these few ideas. We don't quite know what we're going to do and how we're going to fundraise. I think the more clear you can be, um, I, I would say the principle that I've transferred in the places I've been is I prefer to get the most value uh, of time and money out of something as possible. And so I'm more into the camp of I'd rather do a few fundraisers that, that, get high value as in opposed to like a, you know, um, nothing against butter braids, but like if I sell a butter braid, you know, I sell two of them for $16 and I get half that money, I get $8. I'd rather just have 20 bucks from my grant, you know, I'd rather have 20 bucks from grandma go to that trip than have her buy two butter braids and get only eight. So I like to try to make the most use of our time and not be spread so thin that you're just completely exhausted from every single, every single fundraiser. And I think that's something that, um, was actually kind of dictated to me from both both my churches that I've really served at from council and elders, but it's something that's worked well. It's it's a good thing we weren't uh, we're not sponsored by Butter Braids. That would have been a really awkward <laughs> moment. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know. so, ins insert whatever you know item fundraiser you want. <laughs> <laughs> So one of the things when you're kind of out, when you're laying out uh, the fundraisers you're going to do and stuff like this, certainly one of the things that are important um, is is having making sure your leadership's on on uh, board, uh, parents, uh, adult leaders, councils, elders, uh, pastor. How how do you go about making sure that that kind of the, your core leadership understands why you do what you do and they're in support of what you do? Uh, when we set out on the youth gathering to grab uh, the right people to be a part of the process, um, we've had uh, lots of adults who want to be leaders on that trip. Um, 
oftentimes it's been more adults that want to go than we can take with us um, or want to take with us just for ratios sake. And so as part of our process, it's a whole nother piece of conversation, but um, we go through a whole registration and communication and, and selection process of our adults. And in the, in that conversation, um, it's laid out pretty specifically that um, as a leader on this trip and as you plan over the next year, here are the things that we expect that you will be a part of, that you will be taking on as leadership roles and included in that are the fundraisers um, that you would be present, that you would help work with me and whoever else on staff to carry out uh, the success of the fundraisers that we choose to do. And so again, it kind of speaks to the covenant probably that Daniel was talking about in that um, our adults agree to, in the sense of job description or covenant at the beginning of this. And it, it, there's time for questions and communication and, and understanding that here's what we're planning on and here's where we need your help. Um, and so that's, that's how we look at it. A lot of the fundraisers that have happened at Emmanuel have been consistent over the years. So there is some familiarity and continuity with that. Um, so as far as people being on board, they're, they're, more comfortable with the familiar. Um, that's not to say we can't do something different and new, but along the lines of what Daniel said as well, trying to get the, the most bang for your buck. And some are looking for that trivia night every year or the dinner auction being served by the kids. So uh, if we would do something that's new, which we did last year, I believe it was, then just communicating like at our leadership team meeting so everyone understands if they're asked the question what this fundraiser is all about. Yeah, my, my favorite line from, a, from an adult is, I'm coming on youth gathering. And I go, oh, oh really, you are? <laughs> so like Jeremy said, having, having an application process. And um, in, in our camp, we try to take a variety of ages. So I, I, I love it when I can take, you know, a 20 something, a couple parents, um, maybe that, that, that 50, 60 year old in the congregation, you know, that we have kind of an intergenerational experience, not just, um, you know, anybody that wants to, to, to say to come. And, and I like what Jeremy said with kind of the job descriptions too, that, um, you know, I think it's fair to say some adults think this is just kind of a vacation with their youth for the week. And I go, no, you're here to serve these kids for a week on top of the whole year. And so I think that's good to clarify. I could, I could speak to as well. My, my, my church in Minnesota, you know, at first um, there was, there was a little bit of tension and, and we were not fully aligned with how we would fundraise and they were very heavy item fundraising. And we had a preschool and we had, um, you know, we were the kind of church where if we needed a new roof, we would have to raise the money to get a new roof. That's something that just was not in the budget type thing. And with our ministry there, and I remember it, and I was fortunate that it was a council elders thing that said, hey, we can't have the youth group every month for at least a year, but maybe even two or three with what we're selling this item and now this item, or now we're doing this dinner and that. And it said, it's gotta be streamlined somehow that people just aren't always being hit up at church for money. And, but I remember being with my youth board at the time and we were really having those, those tough conversations. I was new, I was very young and there was some, some lay people that had been carrying the ministry. And so I had to kind of go through that. Um, I probably should have listened more than I did, but really sitting down with them and saying, so what did we do? What did work? What, why, why are we doing it this way? Here, here's what leadership is instructing me to do. And that's stuff that you want to try to work out, I think, as soon as you can. So you're not sitting there in maybe February of the gathering year, ready to go on the trip in just a few months. And then you're maybe having that, that tension or those rough conversations and frustration. And I don't think you ever get away that completely. But that's something that um, I know is, is not, not always easy when you're not, you don't have that alignment. Yeah, I, I remember one time when uh, it, it was early on in my ministry where they, uh, I, I had one of our, uh, our elders compare the youth ministry to the moment when Jesus came into the temple and started flipping tables. <laughs> it's like, man, they've got, they've got like three tables of fundraisers everywhere. <laughs> so I... Uh, so we're, we're about to get to the moment, and, and uh, one of the things that I love is we're going to ask about some of the fundraisers you guys do to give different ideas that people are coming saying, hey, I'm looking for maybe a new thing that we do, or um, uh, just some of the things that you found successful, I'll share some stories about maybe some fundraisers that, that didn't go well as well. Uh, so we're, we're about to get to that. Um, before we do that, I, as, as you, as you, 
I know we mentioned this at one point. We talked about adults that are that are uh, brought, and just kind of get your pr perspective. Um, how typically do you handle that? Do you is that a is that a trip that that you cover their cost? Um, I think Jeremy, you talked about the third. Uh, you cover their costs. Is that part of the budget? Do you, is that does that get added onto the kids? And that's another thing that they have to fundraise. How do you approach that with adult costs? Yeah, the adult costs. Like I said, uh, the adults are expected <laughs> to pay a third of their trip, and so we're gonna we're gonna cover the other two thirds either from the budget that we have in youth ministry um, and the money from fundraising. So that's that's up front. That's a third for our adult leaders. Mm -hmm. We have that same practice for the gathering and for certain events. There's a set amount that the adult leaders pay and then the rest of it gets covered. We, um, we just do it a little different. We, we, we pay for our leaders, but not all of them, but typically some end up, you know, they're, they're helping with our fundraisers. They're typically in a position to contribute some, not, not always. I, my, my stance is I don't expect them and there's no even like unsaid expectation. We expect you to pay for part or all of your trip, but we, we, we pay for it. But if somebody wants to make a donation, I'm not going to, I'm not going to stop them. So um, we, we've handled it that way and had, had success knowing that, you know, if you're going to give up a week of your vacation time, um, time away from work or family or other responsibilities, we really want to, and, and the other commitments throughout the year, that's that's at least how we've chose at our congregation to to honor honor our, our our leaders. I like that, Dan. I've spoken to that too in terms of uh, leadership at congregations before that have said, "Well, why are we spending X number of dollars yeah. for them to go on this trip?" And I say, "Well, what you're really spending on is thirteen hundred dollars for a a year long part time youth worker." When you look at it that way. What's a hundred bucks a month to cover your adults that are going to be working with these youth yeah. for for intense amount of times over this next year and trip? So that's that's a pretty cheap youth worker if you've got a bay part time youth. <laughs> yeah, that's good. I I want to throw a question at you. So Kristen's got a great question here, and see what you think. My experience is that fundraise costs about fifty percent of what they bring in supplies for soup suppers, bake sales, etc. How do you feel about bakeless bake sales? or things along that line, which basically ask people to make a donation of a percentage of what they would probably spend on that fundraisers, or asking people to add $2 a week to their offering for NYG. For example, my church is doing a rummage sale this summer for a building project. Uh, that is a ton of work, and I'd rather just say, give us a donation. So um, we've done the wall of money fundraiser where we just put out envelopes with different amounts on it and encourage people to, to take them and make a donation. Some people don't want to buy wrapping paper or like Daniel offered what he wouldn't want to buy. Um, but <laughs> some people don't have the time either to go to dinners or, or other things. They just want to make that donation. So, so we've done it that way, make it a little fun and say, hey, there's 100 envelopes. We'd like to get rid of them all. If you want to donate a dollar, take the dollar envelope. If you want to donate $50, take that one. And we've, we've made several thousand dollars off of that donation system. That's why I've gotten away from events that actually sell things because I, I feel the same way. I'm doing all this work and I'm only getting a really small percentage of, of the money that's coming in. So we try to do events um, uh, like we, we do a 5K uh, run on Easter morning. And, uh, and so our resurrection run bring in, brings in money both from participants that are running, which is just, it's money had. I mean, we've got to pay for shirts and things like that, but I also have sponsors on the back of our shirt. So if I can put six or seven sponsors on the back of my shirt at $500 a sponsor, I know I'm already making a few thousand bucks before we even get started. And I haven't done anything but make a few phone calls to some organizations to sponsor us. So I, I try to get at, uh, at that by doing events versus selling stuff. I like to, um, I don't know if you always escape this, but I like to have, um, especially in ministry, that connection of relationships and donation, that it's not just, hey, we asked for money and there's nothing, there's no, nothing else beyond that. So what, what we do, a couple things for our mission trips and our youth gathering, you know, I, we just did a, um, for mission trips this year, we just did um, a dinner. So the youth hosted a dinner. I had youth share the vision of the youth ministry. Some kids shared some testimonies. I had one of our college kids come and I did do an ask for money. 
but I outlaid, here's what's going on. And we had youth there serving. There was conversations taking place. It was a fellowship event for um, a select group of our congregation that I knew probably had a vested interest in youth ministry, it either had kids in or it helped volunteer at other times. And um, that works really well. Our um, auction that we do for youth gathering, that's probably the biggest social celebration our congregation does every three years. Um, our congregation outside of worship or Easter Sunday or Christmas does not gather like that, um, where they can just, hey, catch up and how's, how's Jeremy doing? How's Jolene doing? How's Derek doing? And so I like to have that where there's connection and feedback We've done the, um, not the fundraising wall, but like the Club 52, mm -hmm. where we encourage you to give, you know, any amount, but if you gave a dollar a week, that'd be $52. And with that, we do a dinner afterwards so that the youth get to, hear, get to say, hey, grandma, this is what I did on the trip. And, they, and if grandma can come to that dinner, um, they can share and I have table questions so that it's not just, hey, I give 20 bucks. How was the trip? That was good. And there's no other further explanation of ministry or how Christ worked in their lives and stuff. And so that's a value that we try to lift up. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Um, so here's what I want to do. I want to go into um, to talking about like some of the specific fundraisers you guys do. And I, I know you, you talked a lot about making sure that it really counts and putting more into to some bigger ones. And so I want you to tell a little bit of a story about uh, what you do, uh, what you like about it, what you find successful about it. Uh, and we'll, we'll just do some sharing kind of time. I, I do want to, Tim shared, I, I love this, right? Our mm -hmm. best fundraiser was selling stocks to invest in our youth. We provide shareholders updates, postcards from NYG, and simple thank you luncheons after the gathering. So uh, kind of getting at that last thing, it's, it's pure profit, right? That comes in and, and is able to help with the group and not reinvest into to products. So um, it's a great idea. Uh, so let's throw that out to you guys. What, what are, what's your, your favorite fundraiser go-tos? I would say the most profitable one is probably the trivia night. Um, you get sponsors for the different rounds of trivia. You have um, the hundred questions of trivia. People get together. There's people who just go trivia night to trivia night. So it's something fun for people to do. And you can make it as complex or as simple as you want. You can have contests, table decorating, costumes, but that's one that really gets the youth all involved in connecting with the people as well, serving them at their tables. We have a rent to youth round where they have to go and help answer the questions at the table. So, so that's one that's been continuously profitable and, and also a lot of fun for the people who come. Yeah, I gotta tell you, Jolene, I, I went to my first trivia night about a month ago and didn't realize how big of a thing within the St. Louis region, how big of a thing trivia was in Minnesota, <laughs> Not at all, and uh, it it was it was amazing. I just even I know a lot of you talked about the community aspect mm -hmm. of of events that that bring people together, and just even the, the the fun around our table that we had and and what we know. It it was a great event. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I second that on the trivia night. That trivia nights were just like, what are you talking about down here in Florida? Nobody has a clue. <laughs> Um, but people love our, they're like, you, could you do these like twice a year? I'm like, no, you don't know how much work it is. Once is great. Um, but it is, it's cool to have that. Uh, I mentioned the resurrection run, the 5k that we do that generates a lot of money. It's a lot of fun and uh, it's a good outreach event too. There are people that come to that on Easter morning, um, it spins out of our, our sunrise service that morning. That's what we do. And so people will come to that, but they might not come to worship. And so that's kind of a cool outreach aspect to that. But I think for me, the one that I've loved over the years is not something that I started. I got to give props to Ben Freudenberg on this one, but the, uh, the free car wash. Um, and it's free in that we wash cars, as many cars as we can the day of the car wash. All the money is generated by getting pledges by how many cars we will wash during the, that day. So, you know, we down here, we have a little smaller group. We'll, our goal is to try and wash 300 cars. And so people, kids will get pledges ahead of time. Will you uh, pledge me, you know, a dollar a car, you know, for 300 bucks or, you know, 10 cents a car or whatever it is. Or if the pledge system is too confusing, throw down 25 bucks and that's fine, you know, and they'll, they'll do that all ahead of time. And then our community comes in with their cars and uh, they get them washed and we don't accept any money the day of. So when you typically see a car wash, there's kids washing cars and then you throw them a 20 and you leave, our kids won't take the money. And the community is appalled flabbergasted, confused. And um, I've had people, I, I tell the kids, I said, don't take their money. This is free. We want this to be free. I write a little note that they get at the beginning 
talking about how grace is free. So, you know, we, we can't take the money. It's, it's going to hope it's going to make that whole thing be a, a non-issue. So um, I've had people throw twenties out their window and drive away in disgust. And, and that's the best way it works. But I've also had people write in afterwards and say, and even read letters to newspapers saying, I can't believe the kids at this church, they did this and they didn't even want my money. Um, so it, it's pretty cool. And we've made a lot of money on that too. It's a lot of work, um, but uh, it, it generates a lot more money, I think, from the pledging standpoint than actually uh, you would get if you just did donations. Yeah. Hey, just before uh, Daniel, you jump in, I, a question that, that came up for you, Jeremy, uh, how do you pick your sponsors for the 5k? How do you go about that? Uh, first I start with people I know <laughs> and that's just cause I know if I, I know them, it's going to be an easier, it's going to be harder for them to say no to me. Um, so uh, people in our congregation who have businesses, uh, people in our congregation who have connections to businesses or work, and I'll just go and ask them and uh, say, and I give them a $250 for a small logo or 500 for a large logo. Uh, it's not going to break the bank. If you get them right away in the beginning of their year, a lot of times businesses have money to, to give towards that kind of advertising. They can roll it into that. And so, um, but I have done cold calls to restaurants that I enjoy going to. And uh, sometimes the managers will, will say, yeah, put me down for $500. I'll send you the check and, and we'll, we'll, put I love tacos on the back of your shirt and uh, it works for me. Uh, but yeah, I get more no's than yeses. And uh, the, the cool part is, is uh, I do a lot of those asks because I just, I don't have a problem doing that, but I've trained some of the kids to do that. Or if I've done the first year ask, I'll have the kids do follow-up asks. Um, and that way I'm helping them get out. I, kids don't have that gift of asking, uh, making the ask and doing that. So training them on that, I think that's, a definitely decent skill to have. So, um, yeah, I've, I've been surprised sometimes by my kids who, uh, one, they'll look at me and say, nobody's going to give me that. And then they come back and like, you wouldn't believe it. I caught the sponsor and they're all excited, but, uh, it took three asks, three different businesses before they got a yes. And that, that's fine. It's, it's good practice. That's, that's good. Um, Jolene, one of the questions that came up too, um, by Carissa talked about how, where do you get your questions for trivia? Sure, so we have um, some members who write the questions and they actually will also connect with people who do trivia night. Sometimes they'll exchange questions. Um, some people pay for questions, but that can be a pretty hefty cost out of your fundraising profits. So um, if you have a network of people who also do trivia and you're not like churches right next door <laughs> that people might come and already know all the answers, that's a worthwhile thing to, to investigate and um, exchange questions as well. Shoot me an email. I'll send you a few rounds for free. <laughs> I was going to say that that's, I think one of the great things that comes out of something like this is you've got some people who've been there and done that. Yeah. And so you, you can go to Jeremy and Daniel and Jolene and just say, Hey, I, I know you talked about this. Um, give us an outline or give us the, the things that you can do. And I, I, I know their hearts would love to help in whatever way they can. Yeah. And if they write around, they can send it to me. We can help each other out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but but if you get the answers you can't sit at a table and be genius yeah you, <laughs> you can't play that's not fair no, no. <laughs> daniel how about you um for us in our setting and this was something that was pre-existing um before my arrival here at, at my church but um, we do a um uh, auction dinner and so my understanding was actually years ago, it was very much youth led, but over the years it's, been ta it's taken some more uh, adults to be a part of. But what we do is we basically, for the most part, put our eggs into one basket. And so I don't want this to sound like the, the humble brag because that's not what this is. But last time we took 56 or 55 youth and like 10 adults. So we had 65, uh, 65 people. We needed to raise um, basically about $80,000 in our auction. What we do is we set out the expectation of uh, the goal, and we know it's not going to be even, but we ask each youth to fill a table of 10. Some youth can fill two. Some youth can just get their parents there. That's okay. Um, then we have them each get silent and oral auction items. And so the goal would be, could you get 10 $30 items? Could you go down the street to McDonald's and ask them to make a donation? Um, I like what Jeremy said. You get a lot of no's. But you, yes, we have these um, printed out forms that you give to businesses. They say where to send the check. We have an advertising book, kind of what Jeremy talked about with the back of the t-shirts and the sponsors. Um, we have the silent auction. We have the oral auction. 
Um, I will admit we some uh, are usually blessed with our congregation. Some people are able to donate something, a timeshare, uh, something else. So it does take some of that. But then we also just do a straight ask. We have some people who come to the auction who I don't need another item, but hey, I'll, I'll write a $200 check, a $500 check, a $1,000 check. Um, it really just uh, depends. It's something that us personally, um, we usually get about 300 people at it, so we have it at a banquet center, but it's something that easily could be done just at your church, maybe in the, in the gym or in your cafeteria or whatever space would work. And, um, you know, we were in a situation where we raised $78,000 in one night, and um, I was actually kind of nervous because we had more kids going than we typically did. We actually had our, our Lutheran school that's an association that had their auction uh, within about six weeks of ours. And so both groups were nervous. They hit their mark, we hit our mark. Um, and so the Lord's bless us that way. It's a lot of work. As I shared earlier, we have some that don't like it, that, that think, well, how come this youth did that, other youth do this? But um, it, 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 really, it really works and it allows us to get everybody on the trip. And we have some that could probably write a check to go and we have some that can't afford barely to make the deposit. So um, it, it, yeah, it works well and then it pays for our leaders as well. I, just out of curiosity, as you, you say that, do, I mean, do you all have people from your congregation that just write checks and, and, and donate it towards that, that they, they, they love uh, the gathering or they love mission trips and they just say, hey, here, use it whatever way you can? Do you, you, mm -hmm. you ask for that? Do you submit that? Do you? Some people just volunteer that. They know that the youth are fundraising. They know that that they're invested in it. They know it costs a lot of money for families, especially if there's two or three kiddos from the same household going. So I've had people just stop by and say, hey, we, we can't come to the event. We just want to support. And so they'll write a check. Um, sometimes there have been people who come the week before the gathering and want to know if we hit our mark. And they just want to make a donation to help reach that, that mark so all the kids can go at an affordable cost. We have um, some people too that, that we, um, I have the pastor ask, works great, where we underwrite the dinner for our auction. And so it, it varies, but it might be a $2,000 or a thousand or whatever, or whatever amount they feel comfortable giving, but we go to them. And so right away we go into that, that, that dinner too saying, well, the meal's already underwritten. Uh, you're, you're even just attending. If you don't buy a thing at our auction, I think our tickets are like 40 bucks a person. And I think $25 a ticket is tax deductible. So, you know, you're actually getting a tax deduction, you're getting a meal fellowship and, uh, oh, by the way, it's already been underwritten. So just coming and not spending a dime, you spent 80 bucks and, and it's, been, it's been covered by other gener generous donors. But at, at the same time, we, we have to be very strategic with that as a congregation because we can't, oh, hey, we have this building campaign or we wanna add this or whatever, we can't turn around in six months and say, hey, you got another check for us because it obviously doesn't work that way. So one of the things I'm gonna ask each of you to do because we have some people that, that, uh, that are wanting to know more about uh, whether it's trivia or 5K or uh, the auction. Uh, I'm gonna ask each of you, if you're, if you're open to that, of putting your email in there so that they've got someone to connect with and they say, okay, if, if I wanna know more about trivia, I can just uh, email Jolene and she can, she can help or send some outlines or answer whatever questions I have. Uh, those are also some of the things, as Meredith said earlier, that, we're, that we'll continue to update with different fundraising ideas and, um, and we can help connect you with different people who do those things. Uh, I, I'm learning more that there are regional uh, fundraisers. And so one of the things I want to ask you is, are there, uh, those who are in the, the chat by attendees today, are there really big fundraisers that, that, that are around your area that you can share uh, just a, a sentence about? Say, I, I know in, um, in uh, St. Louis, for example, trivia is a really, really big thing all over the place. Uh, are there different fundraisers in your region that you would say, hey, this is really uh, this is a real, this is a winner in, um, in certain places because we have found that there's some people that like, for example, come from the St. Louis area and then they go someplace else, as Jeremy was talking about, and they bring that idea and people love it and it's so new. So you have the, you have the whole market there, right? Which is kind of a nice thing here. It's a kind of competition between <laughs> people. Um, so if you've got different things like that, go ahead and put those in the chat box just to give some ideas. That would be a great thing. And, and I thought it'd be fun too to share uh, your uh, a fundraiser nightmare that, uh, that you experienced at some point. Do you have a, a fundraising nightmare story? 
Yes. Um, <laughs> so it, the problem actually wasn't with the fundraiser at all, but it was because of the fundraiser that we had an issue. When we did the car wash in St. Louis, shortly <laughs> after we had just built our new building, uh, we had put in all of these um, hose manifolds so that we could run several power washers on our assembly line of car for our car wash. And uh, the, hose, the hoses were put in this closet in the new construction area, but nobody checked or looked at where they were. They happened to be just above the main electrical closet. And so as the hose <laughs> ran for eight hours straight that day, they leaked onto the floor and filtered down through the, the next room and shorted out to the tens of thousands of dollars worth of electrical panel, um, smoke, fire department. It was ridiculous. Um, it was the day before Mother's Day. And so there was still no power back in the building for worship the next day. So we worshiped outside for Mother's Day. Um, yeah, it was, it was a nightmare. Um, we, we definitely did not bring enough money in to pay for the electrical issues. <laughs> Thankfully, there was insurance. So. <laughs> So we had um, a spaghetti dinner and auction, and we had that planned for February. So kiddos and adults got there like at nine in the morning and started setting up. We had lunch, and then we kept setting up. And we had sold a lot of tickets, and the event was getting ready to start, and there were no people there. We're like, what is going on? Well, we, we went down the hall, looked outside. Well, it had snowed like six inches, and none of us knew because we were in the gym the whole time. So most people ended up not coming. That was a problem. <laughs> Not sure if I really have a nightmare story, but uh, you know what comes to my mind is we did one of the eat and earns at a local fast food restaurant uh, a few years ago, and you know so you're you're communicating it's this night. Remember the flyer. We're going to get fifteen percent. Well, we ended up um, uh, you know we did the event and and I thought it was fairly successful. Had a good turnout. People enjoyed the food, the fellowship. It was fun to get together, and uh, we then got a check for like one hundred and fifteen dollars. Well, we brought in about $1,000 worth of business for the night, and our leadership was just kind of disappointed that, like, we spent a whole night, we, we got people over here, they rerun their schedule from practices with the kids or whatever, and it's like, we got $115. Um, and so, for at least our group, they were just, just really underwhelmed that, you know, we, we all could have just chipped in, you know, even our leadership group each could have chipped in, you know, chipped in a $20 a piece, and we could have made that money. So, <laughs> it's good. Good there. I, I'll tell you one of the things I love is sometimes you sit around a, a group of, of planners and, and you start talking about the stories, right? And everyone's got a, a nightmare story where the fundraiser cost you money uh, or, or something along that line. So it's good. I, I've got uh, two things before we, we end here. We're almost at that time. Um, I, I just want to throw this out. I, I, a friend of mine who they have a policy that, um, that with all their fundraisers that they, they put 20% of all that's earned, they put into a kind of a separate fund that they use to, to pay for uh, uh, guests, uh, friends, uh, those that don't go to the church. And they particularly talk about this being an outreach opportunity of, of those who don't know Jesus that they want to bring on a mission trip, that they want to bring at a youth gathering. And so they, they set aside 20% and says, this is just kind of who we are. And uh, they have a goal of how many friends that they want to bring. And, and they say, we're going to pay for the whole trip. So talk, a lot of you talked about that grace, Jeremy, with that car, car wash idea, that grace moment. They wanted that to be there. Uh, do you, um, is there anything along that line that you do with fundraising that, that you, you set aside or, or that you've heard of different people um, when it comes to, um, to funds like that? So we, we do a fundraising tithe. So 10% of our fundraisers is set aside for a mission ministry outside of our general congregational ministry. So one year we used it when there was a plea to help uh, people from churches who couldn't afford to go, who had been afflicted by whether it was hurricanes or tornadoes that we sent money to, to help them. It can be used for anything the youth want it to be used for outside of, of their own youth gathering or congregational experience. So, so that's been a fun one. Um, just because they they feel that um, opportunity to to gift someone else with the blessings that they've been given. I, I think it, we do the ten percent as well, Jolene, like that, and it, it can't be church related. It's got to be outside of us. Um, but yeah, the the big thing is for us, like I mentioned at the at at the car wash, just to get a grace moment in a good conversation with people who are coming in as guests that day. 
Um, same with our resurrection run that uh, we have that connection with people who are from the community and not from our congregation that are part of something on Easter morning that uh, we share and have the, the Bible stories and the gospel message along the, uh, the 5k route as they run, they can see and read the, the gospel, um, you know, on signs as they run. So those kind of things we try to filter into our, our events. We, uh, we don't do that 10%. Maybe we should. Maybe I learned something today. <laughs> um, you know, but in a similar vein, what we do have set aside is we have a separate little scholarship fund. And, and I could be wrong. It, it might have a thousand bucks in it or something or 2000 bucks in it. But it's something that I, I think for years had been kind of built up. And it's something that if, you know, a friend came to me or, or even, even just, a, you know, if I'm being honest, a, a hardship in a family or something or a parent loses a job, whatever, we, we've between that and I've even had different members over the years and it's only been like one kind of a year or so, but they pull me aside and they say, Hey, if a child can't afford to go or something like that, or, you know, of a specific situation that I could, that I could help with, please let me know. And um, that's been really neat to have some allies in the ministry and in our congregation who, who said, you know, whatever it takes, I will help with, with this aspect and would, would love to. And like I said, I don't think it's a, an, an unlimited, you know, Scrooge McDun McDuck uh, money, Ben, but, <laughs> but some people that said, hey, I don't, I don't want, and, and we communicate that we don't want money to be the obstacle for why someone's is attending or not. And, and we'll, um, you know, I, I, I feel it's my responsibility to fight and claw and do whatever it takes to say, hey, we need a few more dollars for this and we're going to have to figure something out. Well, we, we are so grateful for, uh, for the time that we, we know that uh, one of the things with, with time, uh, you guys have been doing this for a while and uh, comes with lots of experience and wisdom and I'll never do that again and those kind of things. And so, first of all, thanks for sharing the things that you've learned and, um, and kind of the, the, your heart for ministry and helping people uh, to be able to participate in, in such a powerful experience, whether mission trip, gathering, those kind of things. Uh, here's how I'd like to end, if you're okay with this, is would the, would the three of you be willing to kind of pray for the adult leaders who are thinking about fundraising, thinking about setting up plans? And um, we know we have uh, the majority of them, uh, the large majority of them are doing this on the side. They have full-time jobs and doing those things. And so it's it's uh, it's a pretty big task and undertaking at trying to figure all that stuff out. And uh, this would be a great time just to kind of pray for them. Would you guys be willing to do that? Yeah, you bet. All right. Jeremy, you want to start us? Sure. Dear Heavenly Father, thanks for an opportunity like this uh, to be a part of a, a church like this that uh, um, connects e with each other and, and lifts up the ideas that we have so that we can uh, learn from each other, grow from each other, and uh, lift each other up. And so, Lord, I, I specifically want to lift up um, all of those people who are are looking at different fundraisers for their for their groups this next year as they plan for the national youth gathering, and be with those leaders who um, who feel like they're carrying the weight of the financial burden of this trip on their shoulders, that you would just calm their fears and their nerves and anxiety, um, that that uh, you will remind them that uh, you are greater than any financial issue that we might uh, experience. And uh, Lord, um, provide for these people, especially who are concerned and, and worried about this, wonderful volunteers that will help and assist and encourage and maybe even um, write a check, whatever it might be, Lord, that uh, you would provide for them in ways that they, they don't even have a clue that uh, uh, could happen. And, and so we thanks for being bigger than us and being bigger than our problems and uh, loving us in the midst of all of it. And so, uh, Lord, I lift up those volunteers to you today. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity uh, to talk and to share. God, we know that uh, leading a group, whether it's for the first time or the 10th time, Lord, there's challenges that come up, there's concerns that come up, and every situation is different. God, we know that you have placed us each here um, for your purposes, and we know that you have already selected those adults who will be supporting all of these leaders, Lord, on their trip, and, and also all of those teens. God, we ask that if there are any anxieties that you just give comfort in the sense of peace and help everyone be assured that, um, that we're all in this together and no one walks this alone. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity for our students to go to Minneapolis next year and to experience great things from the gathering. 
Lord, we ask for uh, just a blessing of your Holy Spirit to be with um, the leaders, but, but also as we serve these youth. Um, Lord, you know the, the hearts and the minds of all the youth that will be at the next gathering. And Lord, you know the struggles, you know the wonderful things happening in their lives, and you know exactly what they need. And so I pray that amongst fundraising and planning and preparing, that we ultimately wouldn't lose sight of, of the purpose uh, of being part of a gathering, the youth that um, will be blessed and be encouraged, um, the adult leaders that will be encouraged and grow in their faith as well, that, um, that this would ultimately be about bringing glory and honor to you and gathering as, as a church body to, to worship and to Bible study, to, to fellowship, to grow. And that um, sometimes, though, Lord, we know it's, it's easy to get caught up in something like fundraising as we try to get there on the trip. And so, again, we pray for your blessing as we navigate this together and that as leaders, we know that we're not alone and there's others out there that are willing to, to help or give suggestions or email or whatever that is to help us on this journey. And so, Lord, we lift all these prayers up to you today and we pray them in your name. Amen. 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 I mean, thank you so much, uh, Jolene and Jeremy and Daniel. Thank you for your time. And uh, uh, I want to encourage you, uh, those who are still here, that uh, next month, the first Thursday of every month, we do our webinar. Next month, we are going to, to do our webinar on a one-year plan. How do you create a one-year plan? Everything from info, uh, information meetings to um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit of how they uh, put fundraisers in there and how does it all look putting together a, a one-year plan. So it should be good. We'll have uh, three others that come in and, and uh, that'll be great too. We ask for uh, uh, just continual prayers for the planning process. And uh, we are looking forward to uh, what's coming in 2019 in Minneapolis. So thanks and God's blessings on the rest of your day.